We would like to thank Sean and her staff for allowing us to use this space, as always. Uh, the people from uh, Video Services who record this and who will make this available. So if you want to share it, probably before you come back from spring break, you'll be able to share that link. The folks from marketing, my co-conspirator, uh, Michael Carriger, and our department who supports this. And in a moment, you will get to hear about Via Snipe Halls, a house for Bizwa. Okay. And hopefully she'll tell us how she came to choose it. Farrell Hoy Janab is the director of faculty development here at Johnson County Community College. She's been here about three years. She is a great friend of the English department. She's worked with us on writing retreats and the JCCC rights from last fall, which will become JCC Creates mm -hmm. next yep. fall. Yep. Okay. Uh, she began her career here in 1999 as a, an adjunct in the English department, and she now is in the EAP, or English for Academic Purposes. She's also served as a director of the Kansas Studies Institute and as a study abroad coordinator from JCCC, so she gets around, okay? She, that sounds bad. Um, it's all right, she, I can use all the help I can get. She just finished her doctorate at KU last May, so doctor, Foy, or Hoy Janap. Educators right. save lives, so yeah, yeah doctor. Uh, her uh, curriculum and instruction, and she has a book coming out next year called Faculty Development, Creating a Collaborative Culture in Community Colleges, and she recently co-authored an article for the Learning Communities Journal. Um, she's from the Flint Hills here in Kansas, and she comes from a family that has been dedicated to preserving it, its past and for the future. Mm -hmm. And we are excited to hear what Farrell has to say. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm trying out menti.com for the first time, so we'll see how it goes. So if you wanna log in and type in the code, I asked the question here, um, what is the artist's role in society? What do you think is the point? Can everybody hear me okay? Do you want me to do that right now? Yeah, do it right now. Okay. Right. Do it right, right Or, or any time, okay. until I change the slide. Right. Yeah. Uh, so to kind of think about why do we have art and, and who is creating the art and, and how do we feel about the artist versus the art? So what, what uh, was the artist's role in society? So we've got to make me happy to comment on society and either illuminate people's minds or bring about an emotional response, to stimulate thinking, express personal feelings and help cultivate culture through the dissemination of ideas and values, show and describe reality, to express ideas through different arts, different mediums, continuing self-expression in society. So a lot of important roles, art plays a lot of important roles in our society. So how do we feel about artists who maybe are not the greatest, don't have the greatest character. So here's another poll. Uh, go ahead. It's, um, is it moral to appreciate the art even if, is the, even if the artist is a jerk? I was going to put asshole, but I decided not to. <laughs> so you can, uh, let's take a poll. What do you think? Is it, is it moral to appreciate the art even if the artist is, a, is has some character flaws or behaves immorally or behaves has behavior that you don't agree with. So I just sort of, I bring that question up at the beginning and now I, uh, and, uh, because I feel like it's a conversation that's sort of been, has come about more recently than it was when I first read Mr. Biz was. So as I was preparing this presentation, uh, I, I still was pondering, why did I choose this book? <laughs> Maureen and Michael said, what do you want to do? And I just typed back a house for Mr. Buzz was without thinking. That was over a year ago. I spent the next several months um, planning to change it to something more appropriate to me, like about Kansas or at least a woman author or something. And um, uh, thought I had plenty of time to make a change. And then I noticed posters of myself around campus advertising this book. So I was locked into Mr. Biswas. <laughs> turns out I'm glad I was. It was a good thing. Mr. Biswas is what I'm doing. So I found the book in the late 80s. I was just browsing the stacks of the Lawrence Public Library, looking, that's how I found a lot of my reading material back then. We didn't have um, book lists. We didn't have just 
infinite amounts of reading material at her fingertips instantaneously. My anxiety was not information overload. My anxiety was, I've got to make sure I've got my next book to read when I finish this one, right? So I had books by my bed and my purse. The anxiety of not having something to read. So I spent a lot of time just wandering the stacks, browsing, which is kind of a lost art, I think. We don't do that as much because when they invented it, when they started, libraries started having the request option where you could log in, request the book you wanted, and just drive. Even in the Johnson County, Southern Johnson County Library, there's a drive through where you can just drive through and pick up the book you requested. So I, was, I would just kind of wander the stacks, and I can say you can, I will say you can judge a book by its cover, because I, found, I came upon, the title intrigued me, I pulled it out of the stack, and there was the cover, and I just wanted to know what, I wanted to know about Mr. Biswas's house. Uh, it was, and I remember it was a much, it was, so the book was published, I think, in 61 or 2, 61. And so this, as I said, was you know, more than 20 years later, so the book is old. It's got those kind of, uh, the smell of a musty old book, the page, I can still remember it, the pages that aren't quite all even and all that. A lot different from the version I got from our library, which is also perfectly fine, but uh, not as tactile. And then of course I have it on my Kindle, which that's a completely different experience. So I knew nothing of V.S. Naipaul, the author. I just picked, literally cho chose the book because of its cover. And um, reading it, um, read it quite a while, and then, um, well, at the time, I was a, f a great fan of novels set in India. Uh, Passage to India, The Far Pavilions, Jewel in the Crown, The Merchant Ivory film about Passage to India, all of those. I just, you, you know, loved that. And I think when I read this book, House for Mr. Biz, was, well, first of all, I thought it was, it took me, I was about halfway through the book before I realized it was set in Trinidad, not in India. <laughs> but um, it's the first time, the first time I can remember thinking that I had been reading books that were written by people that were not of the culture that I was reading about. So that it was really, I think that's why the book has stuck with me so much. Because it really changed the way I, I then started to seek out auth authors writing, you know, from within the culture rather than the, col the colonized rather than the colonizer. So uh, that's, I think, I think that's how I came upon it. That's why it stuck with me. That's why it, maybe it jumped out when, I, when you asked me to talk about it. Um, it's a comic novel, House, a house for Mr. Bizwas. That's how I pronounce it, Bizwas. I think it's maybe more like Bizwas, something like that. Uh, I, lo I looked it up, the pronunciation on the, on the internet. And, uh, it's the story, really, of his father's life. And it starts right from his birth and goes all the way to his death. And uh, it's funny. There's lots of, time, lots of parts in it where you um, laugh, but it, it's all, Mr. Biswas is a highly frustrating main character. He's very, <laughs> he makes many poor decisions. The book begins with his rather unlucky birth in rural Trinidad. He was born with six fingers and at an inauspicious hour that indicated he might be a lecher, spendthrift, and or liar. His six fingers meant, to keep, meant they had to keep him away from trees and water, so especially um, natural water. And so the village, the entire village was con kind of concerned with um, making sure he stayed away from water. He did get rid of the sixth finger by, by wearing a, some sort of elastic band around that extra finger until, <laughs> until it fell off, right? But, so he got rid of his extra finger. So he spends his child in the childhood in this village where there's a lot of attention focused on keeping him for water. Of course, it makes him just fascinated with water and everybody else gets to take a bath and he doesn't get to take a bath and, and all that. But so he, uh, at one point, gets a job. The neighbor's cow had a calf and hire, he hires Mr. Biswas to, and Mr. Biswas is Mr. Biswas in the book even when he's a child. Uh, hires him to tend to the calf and, give, and water it each day. So, he's, so he becomes pretty attached to the calf and starts taking it out on his walks and kind of, he's very daydreamy, kind of re reflecting and looking at the w fresh water and just staring at it longingly and he loses track of the calf and real, looks up, calf's gone, realizes he's in trouble, goes and hides. Dusk comes, the owner says, hey, my calf is gone. <laughs> Where is it? The whole village assumes that Mr. Biswas and the calf have drowned in the pond. 
So they all go, but meanwhile, he, Mr. Bizwas is just hiding, watching what everybody's, ha what everybody's doing. So he go, they go to the pond, everybody's talking about what to do. He goes back home, sees his sister sobbing and crying over his clothes because they know that he's dead. He goes back to the pond, they're still discussing what to do. His father dives into the pond, to the bottom of the pond, comes up, he's got the dead, drowned calf. <laughs> goes back under to look for Mr. Bizwas, and in the that process drowns, dies. His father dies. Meanwhile, Mr. Bizwas is off in the corner, just sort of watching it all, as if he's just an audience member watching his life unfold. And uh, everybody, they're, they're, still one, they're still thinking he's dead. They're still looking for him. But then he sneezes, and he is found out. He is discovered. And this sort of, just sort of accidental, but yet, if, you had just, if he had just made better decisions, pattern uh, stretches throughout his, his whole life. Um, so he's, his father's dead, the mother's, his mother outsources some of his siblings, she and he go to live with her sister, and he gets to go to school, and he learns to read, and reading is what, it's the theme throughout, reading is, is um, always kind of his solace, and it's his, could, in some time, at some points his downfall, at some points it saves him. And he makes a friend who teaches him to paint signs, he makes some friends there in the um, city going to school. In the meantime, his aunt, his mother's sister, decides that he should be apprenticed to a pundit, a sort of a Hindu priest who, who um, um, conducts some of the religious ceremonies and so on. So he goes to live with this pundit, and um, because he's of a high enough caste from um, India that he is eligible to do that, I guess. So this is a great opportunity to him to sort of really move up in society. And he does really well while, we, while he's there and is quite happy. It's a good situation until one day he touches a bunch of freshly picked bananas that he was, had been forbidden to touch. The uh, pundit, his teacher, is furious with him and commands him um, to eat all of those bananas. He says, uh, he says, look, the, the, the pundit uh, is, says to him, Jairam says, look, I've peeled one for you. The banana hovered in Jairam's clean hand before Mr. Bizwas's face. He took it with his dirty fingers, bit and chewed. Surprisingly, it tasted, but the taste was so localized it gave no pleasure. He then discovered that chewing killed the taste and chewed deliberately, not tasting, only listening to this loud, squelchy sound that filled his head. He had never heard bananas eaten with so much noise. Presently, the banana was finished, except for the hard little cone buried at the heart of the banana skin, open like a huge and ugly uh, flower. We all know that little part of the banana, right? So he eats all those bananas. Ew, he ate seven bananas. He's sick. He feels terrible. For the rest of his life, he's plagued with stomach. Whenever there's anything stressful, he's plagued with these stomach problems that stemmed from this time. But in the immediate, the immediate effect was that he became very constipated and couldn't sort of predict when things would happen. And um, at one point, he, uh, it hits, the, the urge hits him at night. And so the latrine, of course, is outside. And he's terrified of waking up the, his, uh, the pundit. <laughs> to go and making any ruckus to go out and use it. So he, um, well, I'll just tell you what he did. He, uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Bizwas decided to relieve himself in his room in, on one of his handkerchiefs. He had scores of these made from the cotton gives at the, court, at the ceremonies he tended with Jairam. When the time came to dispose of the handkerchief, he left his room and tiptoed, the floor creaking through the open doorway to the enclosed veranda at the back. He carefully unbolted the window, which hung on, the hi on hinges at the top, and keeping the window open with his left hand, flung the handkerchief as far as he could with his right. And of course, left and right has a significant, some significance there. But his hands were too short. The window was heavy. There was too little space for him to maneuver, and he heard the handkerchief fall not far off. And it landed in the oleander tree just outside the window, which the flowers from the oleander tree are used in puja in their uh, morning ceremonies. And so it's, he's just desecrated that, and the, that's the end. He's sent back to his, um, back to his family. He has a, a series of other adventures, works in a rum shop. And, um, but he goes back to his sign painting, because he really had a talent for this sign painting. And hi. And, um, 
uh, he is commissioned to paint the walls of a, the, well, not the walls, he like paint the pillars, the walls, the, everything in the store he, he's painting with odd English expressions that he sees and lots of different things. So he goes to work in this shop and where he sees, um, it's, and it's the shop of the Tulsi family, which is a prominent family on the island. And um, he falls in love with the, one of the Tulsi daughters and he leaves her a love note. Um, he's, her name is Shama. And he says, he passed Shama's counter and without looking at her, placed the note under a bolt of cloth. The note was crumpled, slightly dirty and looked ineffectual, but she saw it. She looked away and smiled. It was not a smile of complicity or pleasure. It was a smile that told Mr. Biswas he had made a fool of himself. Uh, he felt exceedingly foolish and wondered whether he shouldn't take back his note and abandon Shama at once. He doesn't take back the note, but he does leave and go home for the night and is, just feels hugely relieved. Oh, what a narrow escape. I'm so glad she ignored that. I'm not, I, do, I don't want to marry this person. Goes to work the next day. Mrs. Tulsi, the matriarch, has um, found the note, and he's, because he's of a suitable cast, a suitable boy, uh, she says, after a series of many, many painful and complicated conversations, sort of manipulates him into um, marrying, agreeing to marry her. So he marries her and goes and lives with this Tulsi family who were original Indians. And this is the point in the book, I remember when I realized, oh, wait, this isn't in India? This is in, <laughs> right? Right? Because um, at that time, Indian people from India came over as indentured servants to Trinidad about in the 1830s, I think, and um, maintained their customs. In fact, cont uh, continued to think they were more, more Hindu than the Hindus in India. But it was status to be one of the original Indians. And so Mr. Tulsi, the patriarch, had been a pundit. He was one of the original Indians. He was traveling back to India to bring the family for a visit. He died and left Mrs. Tulsi there with 14 daughters and two sons. So the household is uncharacteristic. Usually, typically, the daughter-in-law would go and live with the, with the son, with her husband's family. In this case, all these 14 daughter-in-laws had their husbands living there in the Tulsi house. And Mrs. Tulsi is the grand matriarch. She's, uh, she controls everything, and there's lots of political family just stuff all the time. Uh, so he, there he is. He's stuck. He's married. Um, he spends the next several years living there among the Tulsi family, which he's pretty miserable, and he does a pretty good job of making the other, the people he's living with, they're pretty miserable too. So um, he's just kind of a misfit. He's always antagonizing everyone. Finally, the, like the last straw, he's like spits some food out of his window, upstairs window, and it hits one of the two sons, the gods, he's nicknamed them. He's nicknamed the two sons, the gods. So uh, hits them one on the head. Uh, he's, everybody's furious. They can't believe he would do this to the, the prize child. And so he, sent, he and his wife, Shama, are sent to a, a village where the family happens to own a, a store, an empty store. They had acquired the land because they thought it would, um, a truck route was going to go through. It didn't happen. And they go and live in this store, and they're actually sort of happy. They're away from the family. They've, she, Shama becomes sort of her own person. It's, it's kind of a nice interlude in their lives. Um, but then he makes a series of just ridiculous financial decisions, and he and Shama fight. She goes back home. Finally, he decides to follow her. And so they're back with the, with the Tulsi family, who then send him to go work on the sugar plantation, sugar estate that the family owns. And uh, he sort of supervises the truck drivers, but he's not really respected. He's a very slight character. They talk about his, his calves are like hammocks that just swing in the, <laughs> in the air. In fact, at one point, there's quite a lot of flogging and beating in this book. And at one point, he hits his wife, Shama, and they both know she could beat him up with no <laughs> problem at all. So there's lots of, yeah, he's a, a slight character, or you know, a, a smallish kind of figure, and um, living there, and so there's barracks. And, but the one thing about it, he lives in the barracks where he's, the room that he's been assigned there is covered, it's papered over with newspapers. All the walls are covered with newspapers as wallpaper. And so kind of his solace there is to lie in bed and just read all the newspapers on the wall. And this is where he starts to think about 
um, having his own house, building, having a, a place of his own to live. So many other mishaps happen. I won't go into detail on all of those, but eventually he makes it to Port of, Port of, Port of Spain, which is the city, and um, he ch happens upon the Sentinel newspaper. He happens, what, the person working there happens to be an old acquaintance of his. He says, just take me on for one month unpaid. I, I know I can do it. So they do. He gets uh, one month's trial, and he writes stories like, Daddy comes home in a coffin, and four children roasted in hut blaze. So he writes these kind of salacious, sensational stories, which is really what the newspaper is, and it makes enough money that he can bring his family to live in a home that's owned by her family um, there in the town. Then the paper gets taken over by, it's sort of, this is during World War II, the paper gets taken over by more serious journalists who want him to tell the truth, and he becomes very bored with having to cover cricket matches and obituaries and court cases and so on. So he starts to feel kind of miserable. Uh, well, he's, he often vacillates between miserable and content. Um, but the family, the Tulsi family, that he, this huge family that he had married into, they had moved to another estate, a sh a sort of in a different part of the island with kind of a different kind of climate. And there's lots of in hilarious and interesting things that happened there. But at the, finally there, he's able to, to, he had designed a house, and he finds the means to, on that property to build that house. So they, they build his dream house, and the family moves into it. And they've had the same, they have the same like five pieces of furniture that they take with them wherever, they're go, wherever they go, including the bed that they have to soak in kerosene every so often because it's filled with bed bugs, and the, because the bed bugs, over all the travels, the bed bugs never go away. And like a chest of drawers and a, a Japanese tea set that is his wife. So these possessions just travel with him wherever they go. So they move into their, their house that they built. They're, it's all, it's great. His dream is true. Uh, one day they decide to um, burn the dead grass out of the, on the field out behind the house. Controlled burn, as we would call it. <laughs> they spend a long time uh, setting up different points of fire and digging a ditch to keep it from, you know, spend a very, very long time preparing. Nothing will ignite, just some smoke smoldering, nothing happening. So. Uh, they go to bed, they wake up in the night, the field's on fire and the entire house catches on fire and it burns to the ground. So once again, but he's without a home. And so they move back to, to um, Port of Spain and live in this communal house. They have two rooms in this house where all of the family is. And um, he has, the, one of the Tulsi sons, one of the gods returns. He'd, he had been sent to England and became a doctor. And they talked about this being a, a new cast. The, 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 um, the family members who go off to, to in, go back, to get educated in England and come back and have all these ideas and, and a little bit, um, oh, he uses the word scathing constantly, just the scathing and they, uh, yeah. So, and he's a communist. So Mr. Biswas gets tired of his arrogance pretty quick. He's pretty miserable. He chances upon a house that's for sale. He has a little bit of money he borrows some more money from a relative, sight unseen or barely, he goes and just sort of looks it over but doesn't, buys it, moves his whole family there. Of course, it's a terrible house, like the, the um, bricks are, are hollow, the, none of the doors open and shut, it's, but you know, they sort of make the best of it. He's finally got a house of his own and um, in five years he has two heart, two heart attacks and dies. So that <laughs> is the life of Mr. Biswas, who of course is, Naipaul's father. He wrote it about his father, the story of his father's life. Um, it's not a really cheerful e ending. I think <laughs> the one of a, a paragraph that I thought sort of captured um, what what the importance of the house was like for Mr. Biswas. He's having he's out. He's thinking about buying this house. He wants out of where he is, and he's he's stopped at a some sort of drinking establishment and meets up with somebody there who says, um, the, the person he's talking to says, you can't get a good place to rent for all the tea in China. The man said, he edged his way around Mr. Bezwas, cutting him off from the talkers, some of whom were beginning to eat, the bar, the tables. Much easier to buy a house in the long run. What are you drinking, lager? Two lagers, miss, a hell of a thing, man. 
The loggers came. I know, the man said. I was in the same position not so long ago. I only had my mother. But even that was hell, I could tell you, is like being sick. Sick? When you're sick, you forget what it is to be well. And when you're well, you don't really know what it is to be sick. It's the same with not having a place to go back to every afternoon. And I think we do know that feeling of when you're sick, you feel like you'll never be well again. And then once you feel better, you feel so much better. And I think that, I felt like that sort of captured why uh, it was, it, you know, for Mr. Buzzwaz, why it was so important. So I went on to read everything by V.S. Naipaul and, of course, sought out many other authors writing from within their culture, you know, read the, the colonizers, not the colonizers, writing the books. And then in about, I think, it, 2008 is when it came out. I'm driving around in my minivan with my kids in Johnson County, and on comes a book review on the radio of the authorized biography of V.S. Naipaul. And it was quite a shocking story. He was quite a uh, not very nice person. <laughs> Here he is in 2011 saying, I read this, just devoured it. It's really interesting, especially just the literary scene in England at that time. It's really just a really interesting read in general and then about him because I had been such a fan uh, but about this, he says, uh, um, he's been described as the greatest, writer of, greatest living writer of English prose, and asked if he considered any woman writer as literary match. He replied, I don't think so. Of Jane Austen, he said he couldn't possibly share her sentimental ambitions, her sentimental sense of the world. He felt that women writers were quite different. He said, I read a piece of writing, and within a paragraph or two, I know whether it is by a woman or not, I think it is unequal to me. And this is because of women's sentimentality, the narrow view of the world. And inevitably, for a woman, she is not a complete master of a house. So that comes over in her writing, too. So I thought that was interesting. He also, like, beat his wife and, you know, he did lots of, like, just, yeah. Not a great guy in that sense. So that means, so <laughs> I'm understating, right? So that, that kind of brings me to the back to the question I asked in the beginning, do you, do you have to give up the art if you, if you hate the artist? And it made me think of, I don't know if any of you taught, in one of our Compo One textbooks, we had a, Georgia, or a Joan Didion essay about Georgia O'Keeffe. And um, I was going to read, for, and, it took, and it took me back to that, because she's Georgia, uh, Joan Didion. Um, had written an essay about her taking her daughter to the Chicago Art Institute and her daughter saw a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. And she, the daughter says, who drew it? She whispered after a while. I told her, after a while I told her, I need to talk to her, she said finally. Joan Didion says, my daughter was making that day in Chicago an entirely unconscious but quite basic assumption about people and the work they do. She was assuming that the glory she saw in the work reflected a glory in its maker that the painting was the painter as the poem is the poet, that every choice one made alone, every word chosen or rejected, every brush stroke laid or not laid down betrayed one's character. Style is character. It seemed to me that afternoon that I had rarely seen so instinctive an application of this familiar principle. So I don't, I, I don't, I haven't reached an answer to, to th that question myself. I still, I and still reflect back to why I chose this book. I, um, as I said, I was ambivalent about it from the beginning. Some of you know that um, my mother passed away unexpectedly and um, rather devastatingly last summer. And one of our greatest joys was talking books with each other. And we, and we talked about this. Like she was like, Mr. Biz, like you got to do something better than that, right? <laughs> <laughs> like what? She did. So, uh, um, but as I mentioned, my own sort of lethargy led to me not making any sort of change. And uh, she also, we also, another, and since my mother passed away, I have not been able to read fiction. I just, part of my grieving process, I can't read fiction. And so this is the first novel I think I've read since she died. And, but I have been reading The New Yorker. I always read The New Yorker. She always subscribed to it and I would always get her cast off. So I would always be, I'm always a few weeks behind. So the other, maybe, I don't know, not too many nights ago, I opened up the January issue, and there's an essay called Grief by V.S. Nepal. Very touching. 
essay. It's reflect of course, he passed away in, in 2018, so it's, um, he's gone too, but it's, it talks about his loss of his father, his, his brother, and the cats involved, that he, ca that he came to love, and the loss of that cat, and it's just kind of a reflection on loss and grief, and it ends with, um, nearly 60 years ago, my father died. In that dark time, my younger sister Sati hit upon a comforting idea. Our father, with all his cantankerousness, was a humorist. And Sati's idea was that during the time our father was considering the family grief and having a good laugh, something like this occurred to me after the death of Augustus, the cat. We saw him everywhere in the house, the garden, the hedge. My, ide my idea was that Augustus was considering everything in the house which no longer held him. He was considering everything and working out in his intelligent way how he should respond. So I found, it, I found some meaning in coming across this essay at the end of my uh, journey of presenting about Mr. Biswas, House for Mr. Biswas to, to JCCC. So, what do you think? Uh, that takes us back to my final question. My question again, is it okay? Can I still be a fan of VS Nepal? <laughs> Nepal? <laughs> or not? Yeah, yeah, of that? course. You have to be a fan of his to be a fan of that book. That, okay, that's a good distinction. That's, maybe that's the question. Is it, can, can we go see Harvey Weinstein movies? Right. right? And you were a fan of the body of work, too, right? What? You were a fan yes, of the body of work. Yes, I really read everything. And because he's written both fiction and nonfiction and some sort of spiritual explorations that I found um, compelling. Absolutely. Uh huh. So. But here's, having not read, like you have, this author, how different is his art from his own? I mean, the whole idea of George O'Keefe, that she produces who she is, that kind of idea. Uh -huh. Does he produce differently than he is? Well, this book is certainly autobiographical. Well, it's biographical, autobiographical. He's this, the son is clearly him in the book. It's about his father. Um, no, he, there's nobody raping and sodomizing their wives in this book. But there's, as I said, there's violence. In that culture, there was a lot of violence. Um, flogging the children, the, the, the sister who was the most severe flogger of children with the hibiscus branches was, you know, she was well respected. So, he, I don't know, does that answer your question? Well, so in that sense, his art does to some degree Probably, in this book, some. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think about it, I mean, so many, I mean, there are, in fiction, things there are the writers that almost everything you read by them is just permeated by who they are. Yes, I mean, that's true. You know, they, they, I mean, it's hard to read anything <coughs> without seeing them mm -hmm. all the time. Whereas other things, it really, they really kind of mask themselves, I think. Mm -hmm. they're, I'm sure they're there, but they maybe put their intellect in them more. Mm -hmm find things to stand for themselves mm -hmm. rather than, than just they keep themselves kind of mm -hmm. yeah. so I I don't know if that answer takes yeah. from that but if you take I mean you have Woody Allen up there and you have things like I mean to me Ernest Hemingway and mm -hmm. his bravado and yeah. all the things that he represented but he's never been my favorite writer mm -hmm. so I mean stuff you can have I don't feel myself but I just read uh, uh, I'm not fine. Who's the woman who McLean, Paul Paul McLean, who does such a good job of, of taking the women who were connected to him and then she did um, West oh I'm sorry. And then she did uh, you know, um, was it West of the Night who Isaac Denison mm -hmm. and she does such a good job mm -hmm. with them and she did two of you know, Hemingway's wives, and I just finished uh, her one in which she uh, did probably the wife who most challenged him with, uh, um, I swear not the, you're not, you remember the, hmm, the correspondent, Martha uh, Gellhorn, right, and uh, who kind of, in many ways, in their marriage just seemed to uh, 
be overshadowing him in lots of ways, I think, with regard to how he was living and, and being the only woman on the, on the beach in <laughs> D-Day. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. And, and so you really saw how our biographical his is. I mean, we know that reading it, but it's uh, he and Fitch Darrell and that whole group were so much like that. And for some reason, maybe I can empathize with Fitch Darrell more than more him than anyway. Yeah, did they make better lives? <laughs> yeah. Fitzgerald, his wife said you were literally drunk all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Ours. I mean, no, no work of art, even biographical or autobiographical, is, is the life, right? Uh, just as if we went to a restaurant and made a good meal and then found out the chef was a horrible person. So a very apt, meal, it's an apt right? comparison, yeah. And so what we're appreciating, we are as much in the construction of that work in some ways as the artist. We, we are taking that persona uh -huh. and accepting it. So that. as the appreciator or the viewer or the... We're participating in it in a way that makes it. And so it's our confusion that we are trying to impose some sort of purity test uh -huh. where art tries to reach for a sublime uh -huh. and we expect the artist to somehow fit our political view as well. Mm -hmm. And it's unfair. I, I think I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. Andrea, and then, and then Sam, did you have something too? Yeah. And Andrea. I, I would just say that imagine how <coughs> boring life would be if before you saw anything or read anything, you went to look up who wrote it or who wrote it. What is the sense of that? I mean, you know, I, I think that Charles Dickens was an absolute horrific man to his wife. But I'm not going to just suddenly decide that I can't read Bleak House mm -hmm. or, you know, I mean, I just think it's such a reductive way to come at art. At the same time, uh, to go back to my point about a restaurant, I did find out about a horrific restaurant tour never went back again because I was so appalled. But I'm not going to go to all the effort to figure out who this person is and what they did and if I agree with them before I'm going to look at their art or listen to whatever it is. Yeah, to so check, yeah, do background I mean, check. All the men, I've heard say I will never read a woman artist to be back in the day. You know, I'll never read an opera I want. <laughs> well, yeah, and speaking of Georgia O'Keeffe, they thought she would never read yeah, exactly. So I agree with that and I really I think it's important to think about whether you're going to support their work financially. Yes. But at, at the same time, if you can collectively do more with a teaching moment to overcome the things that you are against about that individual or make a difference in the world, I think that's important too. So I think you have to kind of weigh things out decide to me <coughs> yeah and it's sort of I guess how egregious the flaw is and yeah. did you looking back after finding that out about him did that change your view <laughs> um, after you found out the information um, about him and the specifics um, yes. which sound slightly more horrific than maybe you shared um, did it change your view of that book and his use of humor in situations that may not normally be looked at as humorous, like his father drowning because, or his grandfather drowning because his father hid, and it was funny, but now looking back, do you think that maybe he's kind of a sociopath? <laughs> yes, yes, very much so. And in fact, immediately, and this was before Me Too and all the, you know, this was 2008, and um, yeah, it, it affected... Um, my perception and how I read his work. In the rereading of it, I had this in the back of my mind. And yes, I certainly was watching for those um, characteristics that would right. that I could make sense right. of this person who, you know. And it's the authorized biography. He's not like trying to. <laughs> he wasn't trying to hide it. He was. Yeah. So well, and so maybe that's also it that. We don't necessarily have to consider whether or not we support them. However, I agree with the financial aspect, but maybe it does change our viewing or listening yeah. of whatever their art is. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, I don't think it, you can help but have it change. <coughs> you know? Yeah, that's a great point. It's a really good point.
Yes. Um, related to the financial aspect, I mean, I think there's one acknowledgement that people are imperfect, right? And so there's that level of things. But when I'm consuming people's art, and by doing so, I'm supporting the marginalization that they're putting on other people. And I, I would say, to like, to these two examples are really good examples of that. Um, they were able to continue doing what they were doing because people looked the other way and continued to buy their art. And that's, going back to the Me Too, that's one of the bigger problems is we just sort of wash over the harm that they're doing to communities um, and then we actually enable them to con continue doing it. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Somebody does that yeah. in like, different yeah. subjects. Everywhere. Not just ours, but. Industry, yeah. The church and drug industry. Mm -hmm. you know, and we're okay. I mean, look at Oscar Wilde. I mean, his voice and all the things. I mean, the way that's made them what we need. Right. And maybe. And they're, and they're dead. So right. They're the dead ones, I guess, they can go ahead and buy their books. <laughs> yeah. Anna, is this, if this is a Fitzgerald quote, but trust the art, not the artist, uh -huh. I, I, I think, you know, I think about this decade or whatever you spent reading those books and getting great pleasure out of them. More like three decades. A lot out of, or whatever. What's that? I said it's more like three decades from the first. Three decades, yeah, whatever. Oh, well, yeah, however long it was. And, and yeah. I think, I think you know, so people with huge character flaws create very beautiful things that, that change our lives. And, and I also think this is complicated by the fact that you're looking at colonized or colonized literature. You look at people from different cultures, you certainly can't hold them. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to understand another culture, if you're holding it to your standard the whole way, I mean, I know a lot of things are beyond the pale here, but you got to allow for some of that. Mm -hmm. There's going to be some very different ways people come at things. Anyway. Yeah. As hard as he was trying to become English. Yeah, right. Fit in with English society. Yeah, he had yeah. Yeah. And maybe that's part of what was his conflict, was reconciling where he came from and where he ended up. Yeah. I would just like to contribute in saying that I think, I mean, we're all human, we all make mistakes or like um, debatable um, actions, but in a way, I kind of, there's also the question of, is art in a way a person on its own outside of the person who actually made it? Yeah, and that's a little bit what you were saying, Michael. I think what you bring to the art is part of what makes the art, mm -hmm. and so you maybe, yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.